Welcome this morning to Cornerbrook Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here with us. And for those joining online, welcome also. I'm going to begin our time this morning by reading from Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 to 11, as our call to worship. In this psalm, Psalm 19, 7 to 11, David says, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Let's pray. God, thank you that your law is perfect and trustworthy and right and radiant and pure and firm. It seems that the psalmist was just overwhelmed that you would reveal yourself to him and to us. Help us to know that, that your word is, is what we need and that in keeping them there is great reward. Guide our time this morning. Help us to honor you in all that we say and do. I pray this in your name. Amen. Please stand with us this morning as Julia leads us.
Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In ancient religions, people had to appease the gods and hope that their needs were met. But we have a Heavenly Father who cares for us and has promised to meet our needs. But we seek first God's kingdom. So this morning we're going to take up our offering, and we recognize this is one of the ways that we can give to our church here. Um, there's many other ways, but as we pass the plates, we do so as an act of worship helping us to realize that we want to seek first God's kingdom. If you're a guest here today, we do not want you to feel obligated to give, but if you do, we welcome it as a gift to the work here. So I'm going to ask the greeters to come forward as we receive our offering. And as the offering is being taken, I want you to note just a couple things in your bulletin. Right after the service today, uh, Robert Barbeau would like to meet with with any men and do some brainstorming about a men's ministry here at the church. And so I assume, where is Robert? Wave your hand. Where are you? There you are. Uh, Robert, you, you'll just be going downstairs or are you coming? Right up here in the corner, guys. So that's after the service. And also tonight at 530, we have a baby shower here at the church. And this is for men and women and so you're welcome to come, and would you please bring sandwiches or sweets or some kind of treats to share. And also, we have the information in your bulletin about our fall conference with Harry Gardner in October 18th to 20th. So mark your calendar, that will be, I know, a great weekend. He's, he's uh, just a great guy and very, uh, just so passionate about helping others grow in their spiritual walk with the Lord. 
And so just keep, keep that on your calendar and, and uh, plan to join us for that. And there's other things coming up there. I'll let you read them in your bulletin. But as we receive our offering, let's just pray and, and thank the Lord. God, we thank you for upholding our lives. As we give our gifts and our offerings to you, we are reminded that you gave us the greatest gift of all. We give you praise and honor for giving us the indescribable gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for us so that we could be changed, so that we could uh, be transformed from death to life. And so we're blessed in all that Jesus has given for us. So I, we pray that, that, you, that you will receive our gifts and offerings and help us to use them wisely here for this work here and beyond. And I pray this in your name. Amen. I, Dave Buckle is going to come and lead us in our prayer time this morning. And as you come, Dave, I have a prayer request. Uh, my father-in-law.
Jesus' name, amen. Pastor. Our scripture reading this morning is Daniel chapter 7. This is a bit of a lengthy chapter, but we'll work our way through this. Daniel chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, Daniel 6 ended with the rule of the Persians. We're going back in time to the rule of the Babylonians. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night I looked and there were, bef and there were before me the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. And there, were, and there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. And after that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. I call this robo-beast. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit. Can you imagine having a dream like that? I think I'd be have a little indigestion too. Daniel was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying, with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up, before which three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. 
The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will rise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. So at this time, we'll have the children and youth be dismissed to head downstairs. So back in the spring, we did chapters 1 to 6 in Daniel, and then we kind of took a break for the summer. So this fall, we'll be finishing up the rest of the book. When we look at Daniel 7, what a, what a dream. Have you ever noticed that the end of the world is a trendy subject? If I went around the room and said, can you tell me movies and television shows that talk about or show the end of the world, we could probably come up with quite a list. There's all kinds of shows and movies where the future life of our planet is threatened by aliens, asteroids, floods, viruses, zombies, lethal machines, you know, when AI goes sentient, mutant creatures, and nuclear holocaust. Maybe we realize that we do have the power to destroy this planet in some way. Daniel 7 introduces us to the second half of the book. The interesting thing about Daniel is that chapters 2 to 7 are written in Aramaic. Chapters 1 and 8 to 12 are written in Hebrew. Chapters 2 to 7 focus on prophecies outside of Israel. It looks at what is happening in the nations of the world. And it was already mentioned this morning. Turn on the news. There is a lot of turmoil in this world. There's also a link between chapter 7, what we read, and chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, you had the, this image that Daniel saw with the head of gold and the chest and, and the legs, the, the chest of uh, silver, I, I think, if I, my memory's right. And we had this, Im, this incredible image with, it, with these metals of gold and silver and bronze and iron. And it's almost a magnificent image. But then you come to chapter 7 and you have this beastly image. And I would say that in chapter 2, It's a look at world empires from the viewpoint of humanity. The world empires look impressive and powerful. Chapter 7 is a look at world empires from God's perspective. From his perspective, they're beastly and evil and cruel. When we come to Daniel chapter 7, we want to, I call this section, keep your eyes on the throne. It is showing who God is. He's the ancient of days. And other cultures at that time had, had their gods, the father of time and so on. But Daniel is showing us that the ancient of days, our God, is the one in control. The other thing about Daniel chapter 7 is this is apocalyptic literature. So if I were to tell you this, the stars will fall from heaven, the sun will cease to shine, the moon will drip with blood, and the rest of the country will be partly cloudy with scattered showers. It's a little confusing, right? Because the first part is apocalyptic literature. The second part is a weather forecast. 
And apocalyptic literature is, is Daniel and Revelation are considered apocalyptic literature. And this is a definition of apocalyptic literature. Biblical apocaly ap yeah, apocalyptic is a revelation of the ending of this present age, which is an age characterized by conflict and its replacement by the final age of peace. It shows us ahead of time the end of the kingdoms of this world and their replacement by the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. This revelation is unfolded in complex and mysterious imagery. And notice this, it has the purpose of comforting and exhorting the faithful. Which means when we read Daniel 7, it's not about trying to figure out the timeline or what beast fits what country. It's about seeing how God is going to bring an end to evil world empires and the kingdom of Jesus will come. Which is why we have to be careful not to try to squeeze too many details out of the images that we see. Or even try to make them fit our current political situation. I think in a sense, in a general sense, they do, as we'll see. So that's apocalyptic literature. So let's jump into the vision of Daniel. Daniel here sees a vision of monsters. The sea here stands for people, this, this raging storm. Uh, he was lying in bed. It, he says, the four winds of heaven were churning up the great sea. The sea stands for people or nations of the earth. There is a state, Daniel sees chaos, confusion, and conflict among the nations of the world. And he's troubled. He sees these four horrific creatures, and each one more frightening than the one before it. They're, they're like nothing else in God's creation, and that's the point. These beasts are mutants. They're perversions of God's creation. And in the ancient world, it was actually believed that the birth of an ominous animal was an ominous message from the gods. And so these beasts represent kings or rulers who will rise from the world. Can we identify these beasts? Well, there's a link, as I said, between chapter 2 and chapter 7. If you see the image in Daniel chapter 2 was representing Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, and Daniel always keeps the Medo-Persian Empire together, Greece and Rome, then these beasts, in a way, will represent those four world empires. But we have to be careful, as we'll see, not to press that too far. So let's take a look at the beast. The first of these beasts, and here's the parallel between the image in Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7. So take a look at the beast. First was a lion with eagle's wings. Its wings were stripped off, it's raised to its feet like a man, and it's given a human mind. This represents Babylon, and the lion was actually part of the architecture in Babylon. And the, the idea that the beast becoming human and given a mind of a human could refer to Nebuchadnezzar's conversion after his seven years of insanity. Beast number two was like a bear but raised on one side. This could signify that Persia was actually dominant over the Medes, or it could signify that the bear is ready to strike. It had a mouthful of ribs from its previous victim, and it was told to devour even more. In Isaiah 41, God said that King Cyrus would devour and conquer many nations. So it's likely that this is referring to the Medo-Persian Empire. Beast number three is part leopard, part bird with four heads. A flying leopard would be ferocious and quick. Four heads you can see in all directions. Alexander the Great and his armies conquered the known world. By 33, he died at age 33, and he basically said, I have no worlds left to conquer. And after many battles, his kingdom was divided four different ways. The fourth beast really is in a league all of its own. It's dreadful, it's strong, ten horns imply massive strength. Ancient historians will tell us that the Roman Empire surpassed other kingdoms in dominance, in, in even in brutality, in length of reign. 
In a bizarre twist, this little horn comes up among the other horns, had the eyes like a man, which speaks of intelligence, and it had a mouth that spoke arrogantly. So I would say this, that the, these, the identification of the beast with these world empires seem reasonable, but there are limitations. It's as if the writer here bends over backwards to say, this fourth beast really can't be fit into any categories. It's, it's in a class by itself. There's something about this ancient empire, this fourth beast, that even Rome did not completely fulfill. So I would say we should hold loosely the identification of the nations represented by these beasts. In a way, these four beasts are symbolic of world empires that will rise and fall until Jesus returns. For example, the armies of Greece were fast, you know, depicted by a leopard, but Nazi Germany was known for being very fast. They invented a term, blitzkrieg, lightning warfare. Everyone also, every one of these ancient empires no longer exists, including Rome. I believe this fourfold pattern tells us that evil kingdoms will rise and fall and will continue to succeed one another until the return of Jesus. And this characteristic, this little horn, I, I believe that is telling us that there will be many dictators who will also rise and fall that will share the characteristics of that little horn. And the bottom line is this. Remember what I said about apocalyptic literature? We can get the lesson of this chapter even if we're not sure in the end who these beasts represent. To limit the beast to four historical empires, I think is the exact opposite of what apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature is meant to do. In apocalyptic literature, it tells us that we need a new beginning in order to change the pattern of evil we see in this world. Isn't that relevant for today? When you see the unrest in the news, in the Middle East and in other countries, remember Daniel 7, and it should come to mind, it's not until Jesus comes back that this cycle is going to be broken and peace will come to this world. And so Daniel chapter 7, in a way, is telling us, guess what, folks? This is the way it's going to be until Jesus returns. You know, the other interesting thing is that the superpowers of our age today use predatory animals to illustrate who they are. The Russian bear, the Chinese dragon, yeah. the American eagle, yeah. The beast of the present world order changed their shape. But the lust for power and violence continues. We've had evil rulers, little horns, Antiochus Epiphanes, Nero, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, and so on. This is the pattern that we will see until, as Daniel says, the Ancient of Days sets things right. Because at the center of Daniel's vision, thrones are set up for judgment. God sits on the throne. His clothing is white as snow, which is purity. His hair is white as wool, a symbol of purity, and inf infinite wisdom. You know, with gray hair comes wisdom, that's what they say. His chariot throne flamed with fire and its wheels blazed. He has the power to destroy his enemies. A river of fire flows from his throne. He's surrounded by angels. Here is the judge of the world who has the power and the wisdom to set things right. The court is convened. The books are open. The books are the basis for judgment. The books are a ledger, divine ledger, containing the names and accounts of the words and deeds of all humanity. But the beast with the boastful horn is defiant at the heavenly court. But God will overthrow that evil ruler. It says here that the other three empires are allowed to live on, but with no authority. They will bow and serve a fifth kingdom to come. And what it, the number three often represents completeness. 
These three nations represent the nations of the world, which means when Jesus comes, what is good in the cultures of the world, in arts and in sciences and technology, what is good lives on. He does away with evil. He doesn't, take, doesn't destroy everything. Human progress will continue to be done. And it also says here that one like the Son of Man comes riding upon the clouds of heaven and approaches the Ancient of Days. He rides on the clouds of heaven. This is a divine being, but he's called the Son of Man, which is a human being. Eighty-one times in the gospel, Jesus refers to himself as what? Son of Man. The Son of Man comes into the presence of the Ancient of Days. He is given authority and glory and power, and that's not the power given to the rulers of nations. This is a power that demands our worship. This, ancient, this Son of Man is, is God himself, but he's also human. And when Jesus came to earth, he combined deity and humanity. We can be sure that God will defeat evil because Jesus defeated Satan on the cross. Jesus is the God-man. He's fully God, fully human. And when Jesus returns again, his next return is not going to be the same as his first return. He will return in glory on the clouds to bring judgment on his enemies. And so... When we talk about the kingdom of God, there is a sense where Jesus reigns today in the hearts of believers. But the kingdom of God also includes an actual earthly kingdom. Jesus will someday step foot on this earth. Zechariah talks about that. And he will take over the governing of this entire world. And all people's nations and languages will worship him. He has the final say. That's the purpose of apocalyptic literature to remind us of that. You see, the focus in the chapter is not on the monsters. The purpose of the chapter is to calm our nightmares when we see the monsters. The focus is on the day, the coming day of divine judgment when the monsters will receive justice. It's the boasting of the little horn that catches Daniel's attention. The little horn comes from the fourth beast but dominates the fourth beast and as I said, this suggests that, there's, that Rome didn't quite fulfill this. There's a further kingdom beyond Rome that will be like Rome, but will, but will be ruled by someone with great intelligence and great arrogance. This little horn, in a way, foreshadows evil rulers that will come, that will rise and fall. But it also looks ahead to a final powerful ruler, who will be in power before Jesus returns. The little horn represents the final consummation of evil. Rulers will express the characteristics of the little horn, but an ultimate evil ruler will arise before the second coming of Jesus. Paul calls that the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians. John calls it the Antichrist in 1 John. In Revelation 13, it's the beast that rises out of the sea. There seems to be a real person who is empowered by Satan himself, who will be in control in some way before Jesus returns. But he will have many forerunners building up to that time. And his reign will come quickly to an end. And when it does, guess what? No evil ruler will ever appear again. It says here, the little horn speaks against the Most High, oppressing his people, and he tries to change the set times and the laws. Times and laws refers to religious holidays and religious laws. Do you know one of the characteristics of dictators is to deny religious freedom to people in their countries? Antiochus IV, Nero, Domitian, Stalin, Hitler, and so on. But this lit leader goes beyond anything that's ever been done. This leader tries to create a completely secular world, a world with no religious influence, a world without God. And God will allow him some time. It says the saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and a half a time. Some see this as referring to three and a half years, but it probably is symbolic. It's saying the rebellion of this little horn gets off to a fast start. 
but it's going to end fairly quickly. Jesus will make sure it comes to an end. It's going to be suddenly cut off. In a sense, the angel is kind of vague in depicting who this little horn is because, again, he does not want Daniel to focus on the beasts. He wants Daniel to focus on the throne room. Keep your eyes on the throne. It's like the angel is saying, Daniel, you're missing the point. The horn will assault God's people. It will be an extremely difficult time if you follow God. But look beyond the horn. The beasts and the rulers of this world, their time is limited. The heavenly court has set a day when all that power will be handed over to the Son of Man. That's the purpose of apocalyptic literature. I'm going to get that someday. The, the, um, so can we bring it down to our day? Call this, can you imagine a world without beasts? By the way, this chapter doesn't get preached on very often, I don't think, does it? It's kind of, it would be an easy one to avoid, I would say that. It may not seem relevant when we live in a fairly safe place. But for many of our brothers and sisters in different places in the world, there are beasts that they are facing. There are beasts and little horns who persecute them. The beast and the little horns can be terrorists who fly planes into buildings. They are the traffickers who buy and sell children as sex slaves. Some beasts are more institutional. Communism treats human beings as raw materials that are, that are there to serve the state. Even capitalism can be beastly when companies treat their employees as commodities to be used and dismissed when no longer needed. Countries are beastly when they exploit the political weakness of developing countries to maximize profit. There are other beasts that are more impersonal in our world, such as AIDS, cancer, child poverty, slavery, warfare, and hunger. We will not live in a beastly world forever. There will come a day when all wrongs will be set right and all tyrants will be dethroned and all that is broken will be fixed. Hunger will end, sickness will be cured, cancer will be gone, those who sorrow will be comforted. The power of death will be defeated and Satan will be cast into the lake of fire forever. In the middle of a beastly world, we fix our eyes on the heavenly throne. But here is where it gets raw, I guess. It's not just the world out there that is beastly. Our own hearts can be beastly. Do you know that Google can reveal our darkest secrets? There is a U.S. data scientist who analyzes Google search results. This is what he discovered. After the mass shooting in San Bernardino, California, back in December 2015, the media reported one of the Muslim-sounding names of one of the shooters. And within minutes... The top Google search in California was the phrase, kill Muslims. It, in fact, that phrase, kill Muslims, was used with the same amount of times that people searched for the phrase, migraine symptoms. That reveals the beastliness in our hearts. He also noted that there are... that. Searches for jokes containing the, the hateful N-word are 17 times more common than other ethically derogatory jokes. And they are most common when African Americans are in the news. And they went, the searches for those derogatory jokes went extremely high after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Television showed images of desperate black people in New Orleans who were struggling. And searches for derogatory N-word jokes shot up, according to Google statistics. They rise an average 
of 30% every year on Martin Luther, Jr., Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Google reveals our darkest secrets. We think we're hiding, and we might think, can we hide from God? If, when we stand before God, God's going to know the beastliness in our own hearts. Are we ready to have the book of life opened and for all of that beastliness to be revealed? Our lust, our jealousy, our anger, our pride. On that day, our only hope will be that Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, has taken the judgment that we deserve for our sins. He has taken the debt for every sin that you and I have ever committed. He, it was laid on his shoulders when he died on the cross. If Jesus is my Savior, if we have trusted in him and believed in him, then the world cannot harm me. The beast cannot ultimately destroy me. The little horns cannot separate us from the love of God. And so the challenge of Daniel is don't try to figure out the specific identity of different beasts. Rather, just simply realize that we live in a beastly world. And as we do, we keep our eyes fixed on the heavenly throne room and make sure that we have our faith and trust in Jesus Christ so that we are ready when we enter that throne room of God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this passage. And yes, there are many things that could be debated and discussed. But the main thing is that one day you will come and you will do away with all beasts, all little horns, and Jesus will rule in this world. I pray that we will be ready when that day comes, that we will make sure and know that our sins have been forgiven, that when we stand in the throne room of God, we will be declared innocent because the righteousness of Jesus has been applied to our lives. Help us to know that that our faith and trust is in, are, is in you and help us to keep our eyes on the heavenly throne room. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.
you were going to do for those last two songs, but boy, did they ever fit, right? Perfect. Maybe, perhaps someone was behind that. Yes. Yeah. Um, so remember, men, gather up here uh, with Robert briefly, and remember the baby shower, 5.30 tonight. And I'm going to leave you with this verse, what we read earlier from Daniel. He, the Son of Man, was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Amen. <laughs>